So yeah, Cameron's finishing up uh, with a presentation here uh, in Zachary, Louisiana. The bell just rang, so we're going to give him a quick moment to uh, take a breath, and then we will get started, and uh, we'll have video as well, and that should start here in a minute. Excellent. Well, uh, let me know when you guys are ready, and uh, then we will get it started. And for questions, uh, just feel free to uh, type those as they come up, and we will uh, we'll address those. I'll, I'll let Cameron kind of do his presentation, and then we can get into the questions afterwards. But just uh, fire away as they're coming up, and uh, we'll we'll attack them. I'm going to go on mute for now, but then uh, let me know when uh, your students are settled, and we should uh, we should be ready as well.
everybody. We're just going to turn on the video. Can everybody hear me? All right, perfect. Well, uh, this is Jordan. I'm Jordan, and this is Dr. Cameron Thrash. And we are here at uh, Zachary High School. We're in one of the teacher's offices, but we're not in trouble. Uh, we're here to uh, talk about, well, I'm here to talk a little bit more about the river trip. And then uh, Dr. Thrash, who is the scientist that we've been doing our um, experiments with, uh, who organized the whole thing, uh, is going to talk about uh, why he's doing it and what that, um, what that has to do with the river. So uh, real quick, uh, last time we saw you all was in person, and that was uh, in Dubuque. And we still had a lot more river uh, to go. We had just passed through lock and dam number 13. So we still had another 13 more locks to go. And so that took us all the way past St. Louis, um, where uh, at that point the river was free flowing. The Missouri com comes in, as does the, uh, as does the Ohio, and it becomes just a massive river uh, that, um, that it's you know, known for in terms of it's just its, its, its bigness. So um, along the way, we have been uh, basically above and below uh, major tributaries and major cities. Uh, we've been doing water samples, and we've been collecting these and putting them in an ice chest and sending them back to LSU. And so here we are uh, just north of uh, Baton Rouge in LSU, and uh, I'll let Dr. Thrash take it from here. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's nice to meet you uh, virtually. Um, I, uh, my name is, is Cameron Thrash and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a professor at Louisiana State University and what we focus on in my lab is microbiology. I care about all the little things that are uh, too small to see um, and uh, particularly I care about the organisms that are involved in interacting with the nutrients that are present in um, environmental systems. So I don't study pathogens, I don't study things that try to take over our bodies, but I study the things that naturally occur in the environment because these microorganisms are extremely important for the way that carbon cycle occurs, sulfur cycle occurs, and nitrogen cycle. Um, for those of you who have had any microbiology, you'll be very familiar with this. And so one of the areas that I uh, have been studying since I arrived at LSU is the northern Gulf of Mexico. And specifically, I've been working on the dead zone there. And what I'm going to give you a few slides on or a few, a, a little bit of a presentation on here is some of our work out in the dead zone, how we sample it, why we're working on it. But before I get to that point, I just want to tie in how that all connects with the Mississippi River, because uh, obviously the opportunity to work with Jordan and North Northwest was something I leaped at, but it might not be obvious to everybody why exactly somebody who works in the ocean in the northern Gulf of Mexico cares so much about the Mississippi River. So I'll just kind of walk us all through that. And let's see, how do I share these? Just click right there. This one? Uh, the forward button. Uh, this yeah, one. Yeah. Okay. So if you all can see this map then, you may have seen this in other presentations, but this is the uh, Mississippi River drainage, of course. And uh, you all are familiar with the vast reach of this watershed and the influence of all these various states and tributaries on the Mississippi River. What's important to me is the impact of this entire watershed on this region of the northern Gulf of Mexico. The dead zone is a region of hypoxia that is generated by a number of factors. Many of you may have heard of the dead zone before, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, I'm going to give us a little introduction as to how the dead zone works and what it is actually, uh, uh, how, how, well, what, what the factors are that are actually responsible for it to occur. So um, all this water coming down the Mississippi River, as most of you know, is filled with quite a bit of fertilizer runoff, natural nitrogen uh, runoff or unnatural nitrogen that's been added by uh, the various farming communities. And what this does is it interacts with the water in the Gulf that is already going through various physical transformations based on natural processes. The water in the Gulf is somewhat shallow. This is a diagram of a water column, a generic water column in the northern Gulf of Mexico over the sediment. It's being heated by sunlight during the summertime and with a lack of storm activity and the outflow of the spring flooding 
of the Mississippi River, there's a strong stratification that's built up based on uh, salinity gradient and also a temperature gradient. And this stratification prevents mixing of the bottom water with the surface water. And this is a very important physical process that has to occur for, the, for, for hypoxia to, uh, to, to take place. So at this point, the next stage is that in addition to this fresh water input, we are also getting a lot of nutrient input in the sense of nitrogen compounds from fertilizer runoff. And what this leads to is a, a, uh, a very natural growth of algae and then decomposition. Let's see, there's a question coming in here. Does temperature or salinity dominate stratification? That's a good question. And I think that that depends a little bit on the amount of water that's coming out of the Mississippi River. Um, some years with bigger floods, there is quite a bit more fresh water laying on top there, uh, in which case the salinity gradient is more important than the temperature gradient. They work in concert for sure, although the flooding um, is, is really important because it's this double-edged sword, well, not double-edged sword, it's a, it's a, it's a two-part insult in the sense that it adds stratification on the one hand and it adds nutrient input on the other. Um, residence times for the Mississippi River outflow water have been estimated at somewhere around 60 to 70 days, meaning that that water takes that amount of time before it gets fully mixed in with the marine system. So you can imagine that that, that gradient is pretty intense. Returning to this diagram, audio. Can you hear me right here? Audio is working fine. Okay. There we go. Guys. Looks like we're going to bring the camera up right now. Okay. Can you see me now? Hopefully. All good. Great. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Thanks for your patience on that one. Um, natural algae blooming uh, in response to nutrient input. These guys are fixing CO2, of course, turning that into dissolved organic carbon, uh, turning it into biomass growing, and we have heterotrophic organisms that exist, coexist with them, that are using that secreted DOC, the DOC from these organisms, and the oxygen in the water to make a living. And uh, the natural uh, flow of this is that when you start seeing decomposition of these organisms, they start sinking to the bottom, they... The uh, DOC is, that is secreted leaks out. In the presence of that stratification, you can get very strong oxygen drawdown by these heterotrophic organisms that are respiring the oxygen. And because there's no mixing with the atmosphere due to that stratification, we see oxygen drawdown that gets critical in some, time, in some cases. And we call hypoxia anything that's below 2 milligrams per liter because that's what affects demersal fish, uh, crabs, shellfish, Things that need oxygen will swim away when it is that bad. You will frequently see crabs on the surface and all kinds of various creatures um, that normally would be living on the bottom swimming around at the top trying to get air. So going back to this larger diagram, uh, I want to go through a little bit of our sampling process just so you can see some of the work that we're doing in the northern Gulf of Mexico. This is an example of the various transects that we use during the summer shelf-wide cruises where we measure the hypoxia. You can see there are several, uh, several different transects and we, we patrol those in a sort of a stepwise fashion and at each step we stop and we take readings with CTD. We do a variety of sampling at that particular place uh, or those, at those points. Uh, this is the RV Pelican. That's the ship that's based out of Cocodri, Louisiana, out of the Lumcon facility there, and that's the ship that we use. And here you can see our cruise path in red uh, from one of the shelf-wide cruises. And this takes us about a week to cover that territory from Louisiana to Texas. Here's some photos of us sampling with the CTD. If you've never seen a CTD rosette, 
This is uh, the workhorse of oceanography. It has a variety of equipment for measuring salinity, temperature, uh, conductivity, etc., uh, fluorescence. Um, and then we also have these various, uh, the rosette itself is composed of these, these containers that will snap shut at various depths. We can electronically uh, close them whenever we like to take discrete samples uh, at any point in the water column. Here's a view of the Gulf of Mexico on a good day. It's beautiful. It's also extremely uh, populated with man-made structures. The oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico dominate the view line at any point in time. It's very hard to find a clear horizon line. So it's a, it's a strange environment to work in as an oceanographer who's used to seeing vast reaches of the ocean with nothing at all on them. This is the 2013 dead zone. This is about the size of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, you can see it going all the way from uh, the, the bird foot, uh, the Louisiana Delta, all the way to Texas. And the red is signifying oxygen levels, dissolved oxygen levels below two, two milligrams per liter, which is where we classify it as hypoxic. So this is a pretty significant amount of area. The 2014 dead zone just this last year is a little bit smaller and it was discontiguous. You can see that the, the various chunks are not exactly connected. Now keep in mind that this is a snapshot. This is a taken at a one week period. We know from real time monitoring stations on the, on the oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico that hypoxic conditions can last for months. They are disrupted by storm activity in the fall or if there are any hurricanes uh, that come through in the late summer that can also disrupt it but it will rapidly reestablish itself with stratification. Uh, these, it also moves around, so bottom water upwelling coming in from off the shelf uh, will, will move the dead zone around, as will persistent wind activity. So all these are just to be taken as snapshots. These aren't necessarily the shape and size that was there the entire time. Sometimes it can be larger, sometimes smaller throughout the course of the summer. And so some of the work we're trying to do now is, is get time series data to more accurately map the extent of this, of this dead zone. Part of the reason for the difference can be tracked back to, to, the, to the amount of water that's coming out of the Mississippi River. You can see that in 2014, this, this graph is showing you cubic feet, cubic feet per second uh, by month for the various years, uh, 2014 and 2013, and this monitoring station is in Baton Rouge. And you can see that in 2014, we had significantly less discharge into the Gulf right before the shelf-wide cruise, which is down here in July. So this is one of the factors that controls the extent of the dead zone based on when we sample it at that particular time. You can also see on here historic averages, the minimums and the maximums for Mississippi River discharge. And so finally, I want to just conclude with microorganisms. I mean, I'm a microbiologist. I care about the microbes in the water. So I wanted to share with you some of the data that we're just about to publish. Um, this, this graph is a little bit uh, colorful. What, you're, what you, I want you to focus on is that up in the upper left-hand corner is a map of the dissolved oxygen. And you can see that uh, the cooler colors, so purple is zero <laughs> or near zero, and red is Five, so it's kind of the opposite of our last map. This is in milligrams per liter. You can see that there's a section in the middle there that has extremely low DO and what look like three kind of uh, hot spots, if you will, of low DO. You can also see in the, in the picture right below that to the left on the second highest phosphate concentrations that are mimicked in the same pattern. Below that we have ammonia, which doesn't seem to correlate very well, nitrite below that, and nitrate at the bottom on your left-hand side. And those, those nitrogen uh, figures are actually not as correlated with the DO as, some, as the phosphate is. But what's important here is that if we go to the right, we're starting to look at microorganismic data. And that picture right below the map with the cruise map patterns on, so the second to the top on the right-hand side, is a heat plot of a particular group of microorganisms that are known to be extremely good in low oxygen situations and they are nit uh, sorry they are nitrogen uh, they're ammonia oxidizing organisms so they interact with nitrogen in the in the form of ammonia reduced nitrogen compounds and we've measured them in three different ways those are those those three uh, middle three panels on the right hand side 
they seem to correlate directly to, no matter how we measure them, either using 16S rRNA gene information or functional gene information from their, from their genomes. We can detect them at high levels and directly correlate with low DO and increased phosphate, actually. And then in the very bottom right-hand corner is a second most abundant group of microorganisms in the dead zone. Both of these are members of the, the archaea. We have marine group one, or thalm archaeota, and then marine group two, uri archaeota, which are both uh, organisms that seem to be extremely important in low oxygen environments. And so the take home message from this though, is that we have a very strong enrichment in the dead zone of a particular type of these organisms that are known for existing in low oxygen environments and, and for oxidizing ammonia as their electron donors, which is consistent with what's going on with the water chemistry out there. And so the next step is to figure out what kind of genetics uh, are involved in these organisms in the way that they deal with carbon. Um, some of these organisms are autotrophic, meaning they fix carbon like plants do, which would make the dead zone a net sink for carbon or potentially a sink when oxygen gets low, which would be potentially a good thing uh, in terms of greenhouse gas control and things like that. But some of these organisms actually, even though they're very much the same using the techniques that we use, they're indistinguishable using the, tech, the techniques that we use, some of them are actually obligate heterotrophs, meaning that they are going to be continually outputting carbon or they're going to be uh, uh, using carbon as their electron donor, which would make uh, and, and, and converting it into CO2 as they oxidize it, which would make the, the low oxygen conditions actually a net source of CO2. So those are some of the questions that we're, we're trying to get at in the next few stages by looking at uh, the genetics of these organisms. We have samples for a technique called metagenomics where we sequence the whole community DNA. We reassemble genomes from these organisms in the water column. And then we also have RNA data so we can map the gene expression levels back to those genes and get a sense of which genes are being used by these organisms. And so that's where we're at at this point. We're trying to understand these organisms that are responsible for this a little bit better. We're trying to connect this data to the outflow from the Mississippi River. And then in conjunction with or Northwest at this point, the next step is to look at the microorganisms that are in the Mississippi River and how those communities change from the top of the river all the way down to the bottom. And finally, connect that information with what we know about the microorganisms that are growing in the Gulf to see if those, more, those organisms can teach us about what kind of biochemistry is going on in the river and how that changes when the river gets to the Gulf or stays the same potentially, and whether those organisms that are in the river are serving as, for better or worse, an inoculum of sorts for the microorganisms that are growing in the Gulf during the dead zone or at other times of the year. So it's a big highly connected survey covering lots of lots of space and uh, importantly we would never have been able to do it without citizen scientists like or northwest who are willing to take on these crazy adventures and learn a little bit of sampling from scientists like us and uh, and, and and work together so we're really excited about the future of this project thank you very much cameron let's see if we can both get in there yeah yeah uh, yeah, I think that uh, the at least for us, you know, we kind of feel a little bit like um, like trained monkeys, uh, which I think is okay, and I think that's an important thing to to take away with it. Uh, you know, as a citizen citizen scientist, you know, it's to be able to help out scientists like Dr. Thrash on a, on a higher level. You know, you can go out there and you can be really empowered uh, to go out there and, and learn what is some relatively simple sampling techniques, and you know, go out there and and get uh, data that is pretty labor intensive, but it's, you know, if you can combine it with stuff that you already like to do, uh, that it can become, just makes that all the more valuable. I mean, we want uh, people to get out on the river. I mean, what, a lot is asked of the Mississippi River. It's uh, asked to be a playground, a fishery, uh, you know, commerce moves up and down it. And so it's just really important uh, to, you know, to, to, to look after it in, in that sense. And if you can combine activities on there, you know, such as, you know, industry with science and pleasure with a little bit of science, then we can figure out how to how to master it a little bit better. And, you know, as, as long as humans are going to be here in North America, we're going to be working with the Mississippi and uh, just the, the greater knowledge uh, that we can all use to 
to get together is just going to help us do that. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, shoot, shoot away. Go for it. How do the winter months affect dead zone and nutrient transport? Well, the winter months are dominated by storm activity, uh, or at least high winds, and there's very quite a bit less water flowing out into the into the Gulf during that time period. So we have lower nutrient transport. Uh, typically, most of that is coming during uh, the spring and early summer as the as the flood waters reach the the, the mouth of the Mississippi. So the winter months is much re uh, lower, reduced uh, nutrient loading. Um, so there really isn't a dead zone during that period of time. This is what we call a, a seasonally reoccurring dead zone or seasonally uh, seasonal hypoxia. Um, so it, it cycles, it, it shows up and then it goes away. Now this question, how much or what effect does the BP oil spill have on the dead zone? Now this is a very interesting question and I think that the uh, the safest answer is we have no idea. Um, this this type of activity showed a dramatic response from microorganisms. The the oil that became present from that spill was rapidly degraded. Not all of it. They're finding that quite a bit of the oil that was unaccounted for is uh, is sitting down there on the bottom and it's complexed uh, in the sediment and some some things like this. But a lot of the oil was was metabolized by microorganisms. You can imagine that in circumstances like that, the carbon content of the water is extremely high. And I'm not sure if it ever went hypoxic, but it, it, the, it would be very interesting to know if the naturally occurring microorganisms in the dead zone had some, I don't know, latent effect uh, for metabolizing some of the things that were coming out of the oil spill. Now, we don't really see the same taxa in the dead zone from 2013 as we did in response to the oil spill, but we also don't have very good surveys for the types of organisms that were present in the dead zone or on the shelf, not during, uh, not during hypoxia. We have very little information on the native microbial communities in the coastal regions of the Gulf of Mexico. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to be uh, exploring and we're, and we're working on right now. So a connection with the oil spill right now is, uh, not present, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it won't be there in the future. Okay, so let's see if we can knock out a few more of these. So phosphate has more effect on the dead zone microorganisms than nitrogen. I don't think so. I think that nitrogen's driving it, but what you see is that uh, some of these organisms have very different, well, first of all, the, the organisms that are blooming and causing the, oxy, or causing the DOC increases are the ones that are responding to nitrogen the most. The organisms then that are that are chewing on the carbon might not necessarily be in lockstep with the nitrogen at that stage. So you're you're one step away at that point. Phosphate can be released by the organisms that are growing rapidly, and that might be the reason why we see a correlation with the DO and the phosphate. The other thing is these organisms that are oxidizing the ammonia compounds anyway have extremely low KM values in the enzyme enzymes they use to oxidize it, which means that at high levels, there may not be a strong correlation. And uh, the, the organisms only need a very small amount of ammonium to grow and to, and to use as an electron donor. So once you get over that KM threshold, you might not see a correlation between ammonium and, and those thalmar chioda. Okay, primary culprit for the dead zone, phosphates or nitrogen? High phosphate, yes. Low nitrates, yes. Uh, again, the problem in my data that I'm showing you here is that this is after the dead zone has been established. So we, we don't want to take away too much from trying to look at that information and correlate it back to a, to, or, or, or estimate some kind of a cause from this information. One of the things we really have to do better is look at the establishment of hypoxia and the way that microorganisms uh, are responding to nutrient input at that point, rather than just what this data shows you is what the nutrients look like after the dead zone has been established. So just keep that in mind that we're looking at, at a pattern way after the main cause of this, of this system has already had its effects. 
how will the Ore Northwest samples be used? Well, they're taking uh, water chemistry data and, uh, and they're filtering water as well for microbial genomic analysis. So what we're doing is we're taking filters that Ore Northwest has collected for, for us from the entire length of the Mississippi River, and we're extracting DNA from those filters, and then we are using that to help us identify the micro, microbial communities that are present in the water column. And then we're going to be correlating that to the water chemistry data and all else that is known about those particular types of microorganisms, water chemistry in, in, uh, in other river and lake systems. Let's see. Uh, okay, so let's see. The coolest thing that I've seen on the trip, that's a really tough one. I think that you know, each section of the river uh, has something that's just been absolutely fascinating to me. And I mean, up in, uh, up in Dubuque, uh, that was kind of the, the tail end of those wonderful you know, 500 foot bluffs. And uh, that was a really unexpected part uh, of the river that I was uh, really enthralled with. Uh, but you know, once the river comes down past the Ohio, uh, it just, it's, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, every, you know, down here, the features are just so big in terms of how big these, uh, you know, these sandbars are. Uh, how wide the bends are, and um, you know, on previous, uh, I, we've shown some pictures on the upper part of the river, where you see it zigzag and make all these cutoffs and in, in Oxbow Lakes, and you come down here, um, and you and Oxbow Lakes are very are huge features. You get sandbars that are so big uh, that when the wind blows across them, it creates a sandstorm, uh, and you know these turns in the river become five miles long, um, and so I think that uh, you know it's just been I don't know. I think the, the, the for the, the the coolest thing has probably been just how almost how easy the camping is out here. It's a really easy area. You know, you just start looking for a campsite about every you know half hour before you need it, and one appears, and they're fantastic. Um, I guess uh, we're not quite at the mouth yet, but we are getting into the point where the Atchafalaya starts to you know spread out, and you get uh, you know instead of tributaries, it's, uh, distributaries, and the river is 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 widening open. Um, and so mainly it's just the, the features are similar, but they keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, I wouldn't really say that there is a, a worst or best part of the river. I think, you know, it goes back to the river being used for a great many different things. And it's all just very interesting on all of those levels. I mean, some, uh, yesterday when we turned into Baton Rouge, uh, you know, that's, you go in there and suddenly there's, there's ocean going vessels there. There's, there's tanker ships that are hundreds <laughs> of feet long and we are, you know, we still have 200 some odd miles to go and we're, you know, you can't, you wouldn't be able to see the ocean from here. And these things travel up from all over the world. We passed one that it, that was based out of Singapore. Um, and, uh, you know, all of it's fascinating right up there too, um, from the bottom to the top. So I wouldn't have to say that I have a, a favorite, but, um, I feel very lucky to have traveled, traveled it as a whole. And I'm really excited to, to finish it through, New Orleans and out into the Gulf. Um, a lot of people have told us that we should, you know, hit the Atchafalaya because it's 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 prettier river, and I think that's really subjective. But uh, we wanted to see the river from top to bottom, and I think a big part of that is checking out uh, the part where so much of the river is demanded, which is naturally the last part of the river before it enters the ocean, where you have the, the ports and you have a lot of chemical facilities and just a lot more to manage, as well as you know, that entire watershed is now concentrating to this one point. And uh, I think it's important to, to see that. So we have one question here on will OR data be available for online for folks and classes to play with? Absolutely. Um, we're still working on a lot of the chemical data. The, the microbial data has not yet been processed. We're extracting DNA from the filters, but all the sequencing information will be available once we get it sequenced. So. Um, we're very committed to open access, uh, both in the data and in the publications that will result from this. And so absolutely, as soon as we have it coalesced and actually analyzed, we're going to be making that available. Yeah, that's a big goal of Old Northwest is whatever science we want to be a part of is we want to make that uh, available. And uh, wait, in terms of the, the stuff that we've, we've collected already, we've only been limited to, um, you know, just internet access and time to getting that out in a more public fashion. But if you look at the upper part of the river, uh, wherever you see a, micro, uh, a microscope, you'll see 
for some of our basic samples. Um, we'll take this last question and then uh, we have to transfer uh, Dr. Thrash to another classroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, this is a great question though. I love this question. Uh, how much uh, variation in microbial community do you expect simply from salinity versus freshwater and temperature differences? Okay, this is, this is perfect because this is exactly the, the interesting issue of the, the river dumping out into the Gulf. The, the stratification I told you about is driven a lot by salinity differences, and so there's a potential for freshwater microorganisms to be heavily involved in the initial oxygen drawdown steps in a sort of estuarine or low salinity environment, uh, a freshwater lens, if you will, that's sitting on top of the dead zone during the period of, of hypoxia. Um, we are going to be trying to piece together those driving factors, temperature versus uh, salinity versus fresh versus uh, versus fresh water are going to be hard to extract. But some of the other projects we have going on in my lab, where we're systematically sampling the col the the coast of Louisiana, both in in saline, totally saline marine environments and estuarine environments, might help shed some light on which of those differences are just salinity driven as opposed to temperature driven, because we're going to be doing those studies all throughout the year where the temperature will be varying and the freshwater content uh, will be staying more similar uh, throughout those time periods. So hopefully we'll get at that. It's a great question. It's a lot of, there's a lot of complex variables in this whole process. And unfortunately there's, in, in a good and bad way, not a lot is known. <laughs> uh, so that gives us a lot to do, um, but it also means we have a, not a lot of information to build hypotheses on just yet. Cool. Well, I just want to take uh, the time uh, to thank Dr. Thrash of LSU for coming out and being a part of this trip and yeah. doing this webinar, uh, as well as the Canadian Wildlife Federation for hosting this. Really appreciate that, Roger. He's the guy down there who's keeping this thing working. And uh, I'm just going to let uh, Dr. Thrash head to the next classroom, and I'll take this last question, and we'll say goodbye. Great. Thanks, you guys. It was wonderful getting a chance to talk with you. If anybody wants to ask me more questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, my name is, or my email is thrash, C-T-H-R-A-S-H-C at L-S-U dot E-D-U. Cheers. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah. Let's see, so uh, has the trip gone as planned? Um, yeah, I, I think it has. It's uh, This trip, uh, managing it took uh, about 10 months to plan. Probably, you know, maybe about, I, I've always had the idea of going down the Mississippi for several years. Uh, but we really started reaching out to people here in the Mississippi River Valley um, last January. And I feel like it really has happened uh, pretty pretty much as I expected. Uh, but that's because of a lot of planning went into it. And I think, uh, you know, we want to make this something that's happening happens year after year with another set of, uh, of rowers uh, to connect the river from top to bottom. And we, we learned a lot, too. You know, I had a bunch of experienced guys uh, on this trip. And so... There were a few sections where we really had to push up to on the low river some 60 mile days and uh, that's that has been pretty challenging um but we were able to make it uh you know there's uh people out here who are on the river with uh with human power human power craft they talk about river time and it's just because things happen uh, that you don't expect and that keeps you from showing up where uh you know where you say you're going to be and so we've actually we've been able to manage that uh, it's definitely taken an effort, uh, but we have um, we've we've only had to reschedule uh, two events out of about uh, 20 of them. So I'm really pleased with that. Uh, next year, I'm looking forward to a role on shore to help facilitate, um, you know, more events, more webinars like this, uh, where we can just continue working on this model, and making it more educational, and being able to really splice uh, what we see as the value of, of adventure in making education uh, a, a lot more fun and, and a conduit to learn because that's what I get out of it and that's uh, why me and my, my crew are doing it. Well, guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Oh, most interesting question we've had during the presentation. Oh, man, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know if it's the most interesting question, but uh, uh, we spoke to a kid in Hornbeak, uh, Hornbeak, Tennessee, 
and uh, I blew the conch, that shell that, um, you know, that, uh, that conch shell that has the end cut off. And he, uh, he didn't think one of those was real before because the only place he'd ever seen it was SpongeBob SquarePants. And so I don't know if that's the most interesting, but it was the, it's the funniest one uh, that stuck out in my, uh, in my head. Thank you guys so much. We will, uh, excellent. Yeah, so our trip's going to be finishing up here sometime in the next 10 days. So we'll keep posting uh, online and we'll keep the blog uh, going up. And uh, we definitely want to stay in contact and, um, you know, keep working on things for next year as well. Ooh, the temperature, I think it is high 40s. Uh, it's been pretty cold down here. Uh, unseasonably cold has been the, oh wow, it's not that cold. <laughs> but it is pretty darn cold down here for uh, what we've been dressed as. I'm glad it wasn't that cold when we were there. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.